2016 is finally over, and now is the time to look back and reflect on what games define the year. Keep in mind, these are based on my own personal experiences, rather than what's conventionally considered the best games of 2016. These are the 10 games that I personally enjoyed the most. A lot of games came out in 2016, and a lot of them I really enjoyed, so I think it's high time I give each one of these games I really liked a moment in the spotlight, because I don't normally talk about modern games unless it's a video like this. So, it's your boy Nitro Rad, and here are what I consider the 10 raddest games of 2016. Let's go. I don't think I've ever mentioned just how much I love the Worm series. I mean, back in elementary school, friends and I would play the crap out of these games, and the newest title in the series, Worms WMD, is a must-play for any Worms fan. It's explosive, chaotic insanity at its finest. Staying true to the gameplay and physics of fan-favorite Worms Armageddon, WMD is the first Worms game in a while to incorporate so much new. The addition of vehicles and mechs could turn any game on its head, but my personal favorite, surprisingly, was the weapon crafting, creating tons of crazy weapons by just gluing stuff together. The game also sports a newfound personality with a drastically different yet very appealing art style. My favorite in multiplayer action this year goes to my new favorite artillery game, Worms WMD. I'm not the world's hugest Digimon fan, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Digimon Tamers, but not much extending past that. Even still, I've been waiting for the day that a really good modern Digimon game comes out, and Digimon Cyber Sleuth is that game. It's a solid RPG with a fairly interesting and original plot. The gameplay itself vaguely reminds me of Persona 4, having you zip in and out of the digital world via television sets exploring multi-level dungeons. I'd say it's a Digimon game for modern Persona fans and Digimon fans alike. Didn't take me long before I assembled the classic Tamer Squad either. It's honestly also the first time I've seen Digimon rendered in 3D and actually look really good. It's a port of a Vita game and that definitely shows in some areas with kinda ugly textures, but that is easy to ignore with just how surprisingly good a game this is. I had a great time teaming up with my ragtag gang of self-proclaimed detectives to storm the digital world and lay the smack down on abusive hackers. If you're a Digimon fan itching for an adventure with all your favorite little critters, look no further than Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth. Number eight. While the movie based on the game Ratchet and Clank was kind of a big letdown, the game based on the movie, based on the game, absolutely was not. Easily the most pure fun Ratchet game I've played since Tools of Destruction. Combat is the name of the game as per usual, and it is more streamlined than ever before. Movement is very fluid, dodging attacks has never been more satisfying, and the arsenal of weapons creates enough variety to keep things fresh. A favorite of mine is the Pixelizer, a shotgun that'll lower the resolution of your enemies. Speaking of resolution, Ratchet & Clank is the most beautiful cartoony game I've ever played. It doesn't fall very short of straight up looking like a Pixar movie, running in real time. My favorite level was this one here, where you get a jetpack, freely flying around and hunting for those alien brains. It was a lot of fun. Blasting enemies away is incredibly satisfying. Blowing them to bits makes for an overwhelming amount of eye candy, and I could just not get enough. Much unlike the movie, I mean, take it from my friend John. Uh, she saw it in theaters. Yeah, it does suck. In the entire movie, not a single crate is broken. Number seven. Releasing quite late into the year was a remake of my all-time favorite RPG Maker adventure game, One Shot. I normally don't put remakes on lists like this, but the retail version has so much to offer that it's quite literally a new game all in itself. The fully realized world of One Shot is so hard not to get lost in and fall in love with. The character designs are so unbelievably lovely. I think the game's given me a newfound affinity for characters with heads that aren't heads. It is one of the best meta experiences out there right now, with brilliant fourth wall breaking puzzles and fourth wall plot elements. A lot of curious detail too, I think everyone else who's given this game a second playthrough is definitely wondering what this countdown's gonna be all about. And before you start drawing those obvious comparisons to Undertale, keep in mind that the original one shot actually predates Undertale. 
This is one of the most adorable games ever made, let alone just in 2016. Number six. Rhythm Heaven is my second favorite rhythm game ever made, closely behind Elite Beat Agents. Mega Mix is a collection of all the best minigames across the three titles, including the Game Boy Advance Rhythm Tengoku, which never saw a Western release. Every minigame is rebuilt from the ground up with better visuals and sound quality, and on top of that, the game sports tons of brand new minigames as well, my favorite definitely being the wood chopping one. These cat guys are just too ridiculous. I think the best addition though was the bottom screen, which now shows you exactly how accurate each note was, making it all the easier to learn the proper timing. It's the only rhythm game I ever found myself getting way too into. And add a dash of unbelievably adorable story and you've got the best Rhythm Heaven game ever made. Whether you're familiar with the series or not, hop on that eShop and treat yourself to the best handheld rhythm game currently available. Number five. Color me surprised. After just how disappointing the original Watch Dogs was, it was alarming to find out just how good the new one is. Honestly, this is what Watch Dogs 1 should have been. The hacking is fairly open, creating a broad range of strategies for getting from point A to point B undetected. Maybe you'll make someone's car drive away as a distraction, or make something explode, or set their phone off so they won't be paying attention. The new gadgets make this all possible. Drones and RC cars for scouting the area creating distractions and widening your possibilities of breaking and entering. I was able to beat every mission in this game without using a gun once. I mean, hell, I was able to beat some of them without even setting foot on the property. And that's what being a hacker should be all about. Not shooting at guys, but just sitting outside a company on your laptop and watching everything fall apart. It does work, man. I was ready to hate these characters, but I didn't. I was surprised at how much I actually kind of liked the cast, especially the player character Marcus. I found myself rooting for these dumb edgy kids as they took down the big evil corporate frickers via the power of hacktivism. I even made sure to buy Marcus this adorable fox sweater, which I made him wear the entire game. It is so much fun to dick around in too. The ability to click on any vehicle and make it drive away alone had me giggling at the game time and time again. It's an Ubisoft game, so it's bound to get cheap quickly. Grab it when you can, because it is a good time. Number four. The nine-year wait for Final Fantasy XV is finally over. I haven't really cared that much about the series since Final Fantasy VI, but even still, I found myself getting sucked into the hype for Final Fantasy XV as it slowly inched towards release. The kingdom is attacked and it's up to the edgy prince boy and his ragtag gang of band boy members to go on a road trip and take back what's theirs. I love the vibe this game gives off, backpacking from location to location in a modern day setting, but still with elements of heavy fantasy of course. The combat is fast paced, landing those powerful warp strikes feels good and the gargantuan enemies you'll take on makes those boss battles feel incredibly awesome. I gotta tell you, there's nothing quite like barely surviving an epic battle against a titan just to take a load off by the campfire later that night. Reflecting on each day by flipping through photographs taken by your friend and settling down with a home-cooked meal was something I never got tired of. That and Noctis's amazing casual outfit. I can't believe I was 20 hours in before I found this. I love to explore, and the world of Final Fantasy XV is something I was constantly getting lost in. And it's one of the very few open world games to give me that genuine tense anxiety when exploring at night. You never know what's gonna be out there. In the end, it definitely wasn't a perfect game, I mean it couldn't have been from the start, but while it lasted, it was one seriously rad road trip. Pretty sweet busting up that base. <gasps> Bust a base. I like the sound of that for this sort of thing. But there's a base. We go in and bust it up. Bust a base. Number three. The follow-up to one of my favorite games of all time, Deus Ex Mankind Divided somehow took a game that's incredibly open-ended in its level design and made it even better. 
While I was disappointed by the weak narrative, Mankind Divided easily sports the most impressive level design to date, taking into accord every augmentation that'll change not just your playstyle as a whole, but the amount of different routes you can take in sneaking to your destination. The new abilities added so much to the game, including my favorite, the Icarus Dash, allowing you to scale to brand new heights. You wouldn't believe the amount of times I used that thing to break into somebody's apartment from the balcony just so I could steal their fridge and throw it out the window. These poor people are all probably wondering where their fridges are going. I seriously did this to nearly every apartment in the game. The city of Prague served as an excellent hub world, a lot more vertical depth here than what existed in Human Revolution. I found myself climbing rooftops finding infiltration points from above. Another solid entry in the Deus Ex series, it's honestly probably the weakest story-wise, but gameplay-wise, they've really outdone themselves. This is the game people kept telling me to play all year long. I mean, even before it came out, I had people commenting on my videos asking if I've heard of it. Well, I finally got around to it, and... Oh my god. Only the first couple of minutes were already having me flashbacks to End of Ava. This game has hands down the most beautiful pixel artwork I've ever seen in my life. It's minimalistic with vibrant colors and light elements of horror. The visuals blend beautifully well with the ambient sound design, and without words, it tells the tale of a drifter looking for a cure to a disease that not only he, but other people are suffering from. Details even as subtle as his cloak being red so the bloody coughs up doesn't show up on it do an amazing job of conveying emotions, motives, and overall narrative. Hyperlight Drifter is a link to the past like game. You're just given an open world and a map. Go explore and find all the things. Across the way, you'll encounter dungeons, monsters, simple puzzles, and boss battles. The combat is punishing, yet very rewarding. It has a fantastic balance between ranged and sword combat. You'll recharge your ammo by landing hits with your sword. Each hit equates to one bullet. This creates such a brilliant balance, encouraging players to constantly switch between shooting and slashing. And with the tight controls and seamless transitioning between the two, it all flows very well. The dashing ability lets you quickly zip in and out of harm's way. It's a very fast-paced and visceral combat system, easily one of the best I've ever played in a 2D environment. Hyperlight Drifter is the most amazing indie game I've played all year long. You can really tell a lot of heart went into it, and I mean that quite literally. Those familiar familiar with the developer's history will know exactly what I'm talking about. Number one. Uncharted 4 is a freaking masterpiece. I don't really think I need to say more. It is a cinematic masterpiece. It's a technical masterpiece. It is a gaming masterpiece. It's a masterpiece in so many categories. Put aside that it's probably the best looking game ever made. Put aside that they tugged on everyone's heartstrings with that Crash Bandicoot bit. Put aside that it has one of the best and most satisfying endings in a video game since Snake Eater. It's a fun game. You can shoot bullets at people. That's fun. In all seriousness, though, it is the best Uncharted game, period. The bar for level design here is so much higher than ever before. You're really encouraged so much more to freely jump around this playground of a map, fending off enemies from all sides. It's also what I consider to be the first Uncharted game to introduce such game-changing elements. The grappling hook not only opens doors of possibilities when it comes to the series' iconic climbing, but also combat. They made sure every element they introduced fit every situation situation perfectly. Whether that situation consists of combat, platforming, climbing, or solving puzzles. The game's plot really rides on this brand new character, Sam, Drake's long lost brother, and I wasn't surprised that they made it work, but at how much they made it work. Naughty Dog is always setting the bar for cinematic narrative. The writing never spells things out for you. Using as little words as possible in a simple exchange of dialogue, you immediately know all about Sam's past affiliation with and attitude towards fan favorite characters like Sully. I know you two have never seen eye to eye. Huge understanding. But I trust him, all right? He's family. Victor? I'll be goddamn. 
15 years. Yep. Good to see you alive, Sam. Naughty Dog is always pushing forward the standard of AAA games in every category, on a technical level, a narrative level, a cinematic level, but most importantly on a gameplay level. Uncharted 4 is one of the most well-rounded and polished games I've ever played. Every nook and cranny is fine-tuned to perfection. I had to stop and say wow at every which way I turned. But my favorite part of Uncharted 4, and no spoilers here or anything, like don't worry, I'm not gonna show the part, but you know how every time you finally get to the place, you know, it's always something bizarre and fantastical, uh, like a pirate's cove full of zombies or a lost city with an ancient race of people, flaming zombie dudes, or, uh, demons or whatever. You pretty much know what to expect this time around, but when you finally get there this time, when you finally make it to the place, it's not what you expect. It's pretty much the complete opposite of what you expect, and it's really nice. It's home of some of the most genuine casual exchanges I've ever seen between characters. Out of every game that came out this year, it was Uncharted 4 that hit me the hardest in all the right spots. And you know, Uncharted's always been a series I really liked, but it was never game of the year material for me until this one. I mean, oh my god. Man. So now that you've listened to me talk about the 10 games I love the most, why don't you guys tell me what games you enjoyed the most this year? Uh, comment below or something. I'm really interested in seeing what else came out this year that I might have missed. I mean, there are a lot of games that I wanted to try out that I just never got around to. Like, I really wanted to try that new Doom. Uh, super hot and inside as well. It's never got the chance. But you know, either way, I am looking forward to 2017. There's a lot of games coming out that year that I am eager to play. I mean, you know, the new Resident Evil 7, that actually looks pretty good, but we're finally getting Persona 5. I'm pumped for that. But most importantly, they're finally localizing Yakuza 0 and the Yakuza 1 remake. And then 2018, we're getting Yakuza 6. My dude, let's go. I'm so pumped. Let's do it. Yakuza, Yakuza, Yakuza. Mm, let's go. Yakuza, my boy, my boy. a single crate of the entire movie. He doesn't even shoot his gun. Well, maybe a day when he shoots a freaking flying ball.